G'day listeners, a busy week on the Three Feet Radio Show with four interviews. We've got the second of them today and joining me in the studio is my co-host, Luke Herbert. G'day, Luke. G'day, Ben. Do you think we can get an endorsement deal from all this long clothing I'm wearing? <laughs> well, the way you're going at the moment with that Catman Do jacket on, you look like De- Premier Daniel Andrews down here in Victoria. He always seems to wear that jacket at the press conferences. But more importantly, there's been a bit of a controversial issue with the Indigenous round recently in the Suncorp Super Netball, where Gemma Maimai from the Queensland Firebirds, who is the only Indigenous player, did not get court time. So to discuss this and some challenges faced by Indigenous athletes um, in netball is former Australian Diamonds defender in Sharon Finn and White. Good afternoon, Sharon, or good morning um, where, are, where you are in Townsville. It is, yeah, 11am, so good morning here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. That's all right, no worries. Thanks for coming along. Uh, first of all, Gemma Maimai is the only Indigenous player in Suncorp Super Netball. What systemic issues do you feel are preventing other Indigenous athletes at getting to the top level of netball? Well, look, firstly, I think the main problem is that netball in general just has a, ha, lacks an understanding of the, the cultural barriers that we face. Um, and in terms of funding for our programs, like I've been running Indigenous programs and pathways for, you know, over 20 years now, and there's never been any funding or sanctioning of these programs. And, you know, these are really important programs for our girls to be able to a, firstly, uh, find out what netball's about and then B, understand what the pathway is. So there's never really been any sort of support for those programs. Um, and they've never really under- addressed the underlying issues of racism in our sport. You know, we know that it occurs across a lot of sports, but I just don't think they've really addressed the issue within our sport in particular. In particular. Um, and also, you know, I think they've tried to address the lack of diversity within our sport. So I know at one stage we had the One Netball Ambassador Program, which sent, um, you know, girls from diverse backgrounds within our sort of high performance teams out into communities um, to run clinics and, and talk to um, young players in the communities. Um, and there was also, there's also the Confident Girls Program, which promotes diversity in netball as well. But for me, they're kind of just campaigns. They're not really um, getting to the underlying issues of um, diversity and racism within our sport. Um, obviously, there's lack of resources um, that aren't reaching those more remote and regional um, areas. Um, our girls don't have access to the same things that girls do in those city, you know, in those urban areas. And there's a high percentage of our Indigenous population that live in these areas in those sort of, um, you know, remote and regional areas. So we're not getting access to those kind of resources um, that that you need to be able to progress through the netball pathway. Um, And, you know, getting back on the racism issue, there's, you know, there's that level of um, whether it's conscious or unconscious, but it's that bias when it comes to selections, you know, for our girls, you know, they're missing out on that association level representative teams and, and really, that's their entry into the pathway to be able to go through to that elite pathway. So if they're missing out at that level, they've really got no hope of sort of climbing up through those, through those ranks. So unfortunately, there's still a lot of negative stereotypes out there of our people. And um, I think a little bit more education needs to um, go into uh, the coaches, um, the administrators, the people sort of in those um, positions. So they have a better understanding of what what the barriers are for our girls. I just want to pick up on the racism matter for a moment here. And it's not really an easy way to ask this, and it shouldn't be easy to ask anyway. But in terms of racism, what are Aborigines then dealing with in relation to netball? So put another way, are they turned away from local netball clubs because of their skin colour or... Is it unconscious racism, for lack of a better term? Are we looking at basically unofficial racial segregation? Can you kind of just explain Um, this to enlighten us a little little bit more so we can get a better understanding of the issue so Ben and I and our viewers can tackle it? Yeah, it's not... Look, I wouldn't say it's been turned away from netball associations. I think the netball associations need to make their environments a little bit more inclusive and show that they support and encourage our Aboriginal players. So, you know, it's simple little things like flying the flags out the front of your association or, you know, during um, Reconciliation Week or NAIDOC Week, you know, host an Indigenous round or, you know, have the players wear Indigenous colours, ribbons or socks or whatever. You know, it's just about showing our community that they um, welcome us and that we feel 
like we belong somewhere because a lot of our girls, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're very shy people by nature. You know, we're not sort of going to just walk up and say, hey, what's going on? Why aren't you including me? You know, we need to see that people welcome us and include us because our people have been segregated and, and not included in all forms of society from since colonisation. So, you know, it, it takes a long time for us to trust non-Indigenous people. And so, um, yeah, I think it's up to the netball associations to make the effort to make sure that those environments are inclusive and, and welcoming and feel culturally safe for our girls. Um, in terms of the, um, you know, you're talking about the other races, I guess, I mean, you've, I don't know if you've heard Helena Saunders, former Firebirds, um, you know, Beryl Friday, Celeste Carnegie, all these three girls from who've been through the Netball Queensland pathway talked about their experiences and their stories and and it's and it's from players within their own team you know they they might have overheard um, a little racist comment or a joke and maybe the coach has heard it and the coach hasn't pulled them up on it you know it's little things like that that are really hurtful and it makes you not want to be a part of that team or that or our sport in general so I think it's just um, and what I'm loving seeing at the moment is a lot of teams that are currently playing at the state champs um, state titles and state championships down in Brisbane at the moment. Girls are wearing um, Indigenous colours. Um, they're having, um, wearing statements on their on T-shirts. They're taking the flags to the courts and sort of in solidarity for Gemma Mai Mai and just for our people. So just those small little things that the non-Indigenous community can do to show that they support and that they welcome us can, can go a long way. Um, was playing the some Suncross Super Netball games in Cairns great for netball in far north Queensland? Do you think it sort of um, brought a bit of elite elite level netball and showcased it to North Queensland? Do you think it was great to have it? Absolutely. I mean, I lived in Cairns for about 12 years before I moved yep. to Townsville and not once had we ever seen a Suncorp Super Netball game up there. Mm. Um, I felt... Um, you know, it was really great to be able to commentate that game as well because I, you know, I caught up with a lot of um, family, friends and just um, Indigenous girls that I saw in the crowd there that I had been through my program that I run in in, um, in Cairns. So, um, yeah, I, I truly believe that they need to have more of the Suncorp Super Netball Games in regional centres. Uh, hopefully that this is set of precedents. Um, you know, obviously they all, they all came together in that one area because of COVID, but I hope that you know, they see how much of an impact it has for those um, people in those smaller regional towns and how, how it can help to, I guess, inspire those young girls and um, to have something, you know, tangible to see because seeing it, in, seeing it live is way different to watching it on TV. And, um, yeah, I think it's really important that they get more games out to the regional centres. And just... Moving a little bit beyond COVID, although it's difficult to do, and if the Suncorp League keeps playing games in the regional centres, uh, this is a slightly different angle, but do you think then it'll be good for the local economies that will be probably still recovering? You know, people might go to like bars or hospitality to watch games if they don't go to the venues, and you get all the, the positive spin off effects of hosting sporting events. Definitely, and especially um, just sticking with the Cairns theme because, you know, there are um, a destination, a tourist destination, and they have lost a lot of money, um, injection of cash from not being able to have the regular tourists that come up there um, throughout the year. So, you know, it, it's, you know, I'm sure that just having those teams there for that short period of time would have given them, um, boosted the economy quite a bit. And then just Queensland in general, having all of the sporting codes, you know, a lot of the sporting codes come to Queensland. Um, you know, just thinking about how good that is for the economy here as well. So, yeah, sport does play a really important role in, in, in helping to boost the economy. Sharon, could you tell us about the Sharon Finnan Cup and the Far North Queensland Indigenous Development Programs that were established around five years ago? Because I know you mentioned them during the commentary and some of the names you mentioned, even from other states too. Like, for example, Josie Jan, she played under 21 for Australia and she could have been anything. That's another example of that failure. But at the same time, too, it shows that those programs that you have put in place, that they have an impact. But at the same time, too, they would probably be um, have more of an impact if they had more funding from, say, Nepal Queensland or Nepal Australia. Mm, absolutely. Um, so 
so well, when I was living in Cairns, I was playing just, you know, a grade level and just sort of having a bit of fun there. And mm. um, I noticed the number of Indigenous girls who do play um, at Cairns Netball. They've got a really um, high participation rate from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander girls at club level, which is really great to see. Um, but we didn't see that they were transferring through to the rep representative teams. So we thought, well, you know, what can we do to try and make sure that our girls have that opportunity to get through? So, you know, obviously with my expertise and my background and um, role within the Indigenous community, I thought, well, I'd like to be able to start something up that um, firstly encourages more girls and more of our people to come and play netball. And then secondly, give us an opportunity to identify talented players to work with them and develop their skills and build their confidence and help them to understand the pathways better and what they need to do, um, you know, talk to them about high performance behaviours, um, you know, diet, nutrition, exercise um, and all those sort of, sort of things. So the Sharon Finn and Cup was, um, it wasn't me who named it, it was actually um, a collective group of ladies from within the community there and, and the operations manager at the time, Kim McPhee-Smith, um, because I had been heavily involved in netball in that region for quite some time so and I was very honoured so you know to have that carnival named after me is, is a nice legacy that I can leave behind in Cairns um, and for our girls and so yeah so we we've had I think our first year we had 35 teams come from all around that far north region we had teams from the Torres Strait um, you know from the Cape York communities from the Tablelands we even from um, Yarrabah from Palm Island came up from you know the Townsville area um, I think at one stage we had a Mount Isa team. So, yeah, and I mean, really, it was the only Indigenous carnival that was happening, and I think it's still happening, in that area that provides those opportunities for girls to come and play in that culturally safe environment. And that's what we've been talking about, you know, lately, is about that programs need to be delivered in a culturally safe space where girls can come and feel welcome, as I talked about before, and feel like they're included. So... They get to come. It's, it's a real family atmosphere. You know, the mums and the dads and the cousins and the aunties and everybody comes along and plays because it's for all ages, juniors right up to opens and mixed and men's. So, you know, we even had some of the guys there playing. Um, yeah, and I had, um, I had some selectors there helping me. Um, also, you know, there's Netball Queensland selectors that are based up in that region. So, you know, I, I utilise those ladies to come and have a look at the girls we selected a development squad of about 20 girls and then we invited them back for a two-day um, development camp and, then and put them through all those things that we talked about. And we also do some cultural activities as well. Like, for example, we had the Australian um, map of Indigenous Australia out so the girl could actually go up and pin where their, you know, where their country is, where they're from. Um, and if they didn't know, because some of them don't know, you know, not all of them have been brought up knowing about their culture, me included, because my mum was as part of the stolen generation. So... For me, it's been a real learning experience to sort of get to know about my culture and my background and where my ancestors came from. But not every Indigenous girl knows where their cultural history lies. So I think a lot of people expect that just because you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander that you know everything there is to know about our culture. But because of, you know, past policies and assimilation policies, white Australia policy, um, stolen generation, a lot of our families have lost, you know, all connection with their culture. And I think I don't think a lot of non-Indigenous people understand that and how that can impact on a person's life um, and how they can operate in society. So, so we do do a lot of talking around cultural, cultural stuff as well. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen, I don't know, there's probably five girls that I know of that have been able to take that next step. I having come through my program for that over that five years, have been able to then feel confident enough to nominate themselves to into the emerging um, talent program, which is a Netball Queensland talent program for under 16s. And, you know, if, if you selected then for, for that team, then you go down to the state titles and then you can, you know, get your, find yourself into a state under 17 or under 19 team. So we have had two or three girls that have gone through to state, state programs. Um, however, unfortunately, you know, they haven't actually gone through to make the team. So this is where the problem lies. You know, why aren't they getting through to actually teams? Yeah, we're good enough. We're good enough to make squads, but I'm, you know, unfortunately, by the sounds of it, we're not good enough to make the team. So 
we've just got to work out now, you know, and, and we're doing that. Like I've had um, myself and Marcia Ella Duncan are now part of some discussions with Netball Australia on how we can, um, you know, make things better for our girls and our communities. And, um, and today, actually, there's going to be an announcement. So probably in the next couple of hours, there will be an announcement, which I'll be a part of the media conference for that, on um, yeah, what, what all the netball bodies as a collective are going to do to support Indigenous players and pathways, umpires, or, you know, everyone involved in netball. So, yeah, I can't wait for that. And just winding the clock back a little bit, Dan, can you tell us about your involvement with the 1991 Netball World Cup? You're testing my memory now. <laughs> um, 91, gee, wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know, but I initially wasn't selected into that team. I was named as a reserve. And so, therefore, I, you know, I still had to um, train in the lead up to the event with the team. I still had to go through, you know, the rigmarole and, and what have you. But... When it, yeah, when the girls got together in camp, obviously I wasn't involved in that side of it, but I do remember going to watch the semi-finals and um, then Australia, um, and then the night before Australia went into the final against New Zealand, um, I remember I, I was ready to go out and sort of hang out with friends and I guess have a few drinks and what have you, because I thought, well, you know, it's the final, they're not going to need me anymore, but my dad convinced me otherwise to stay home and said, look, you know, I just got a feeling because some, something's going to happen because one of the girls got injured in the team. And so the coach called me the next morning and said, we need you for the final. Um, so lucky I listened to dad because, you know, I could have gone out and blown it completely. But yeah, I was called into the team and I um, joined the team just for that final game. And I didn't get to hit the court. So um, which is probably a good thing because I was a little bit nervous, you know, having come in just for that last game. But, you know, our that, that game really put netball on the map. I think, um, you know, it was in Sydney. It was in front of like 10,000 people. It's probably the biggest crowd we've ever had in, in our country um, in terms of um, a World Cup. And, you know, Bob Hawke was there. And, yeah, it was just a really um, momentous occasion. And... Um, our team was actually awarded the Order of Australia for that game and, and all the girls for, you know, for our contribution to netball. So 91 for me was um, a little bit bittersweet because, you know, I wasn't part of the team initially, but then being called in, obviously, then being able to celebrate. Um, and I guess, you know, you've got to look at the hard work that went in before it. You know, you can't just say, oh, well, I got all the accolades just because I was called in for that last game. But, you know, there was a lot of hard work that went into getting to that point as well so yeah it was a nice memorable moment for me you talk about it being a momentous occasion for netball in this country like to push it forward and give a profile back then hopefully the announcement today um will give um not just netball but indigenous um politics um a move a move forward and i know marsh um marsh has been quite vocal she said in the recent abc article that tracy holmes wrote um for the abc website which i saw that you retweeted about um mm. we've got to end this 30-year talk fest and hopefully today, that spells the end of the talk fest and the MOs is in the state and, in, and Netball Australia finally might come to a bit of fruition, uh, Sharon. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting that that is what's going to happen. Um, mm. This is the first time in the history of Netball that this has happened and also that all of the state bodies and the, the, the governing body, Netball Australia, this SSN um, Players Association, like all of the people who are involved in netball at that level have actually agreed on, on one thing. So, you know, it's, I think it's a really exciting time for Indigenous um, people. It, Marcy is right. It has been a talk fest. I mean, I've been pushing and striving for this moment for pretty much, you know, since I, before, while I was playing with the Diamonds and also when I retired 20 years ago, I've been running my own programs in communities right across Australia, um, going into communities and um, helping to skill up the girls and helping to um, establish those relationships between, you know, the Netball Association and the, and the local community members, helping to skill up the local community members so they can run the programs themselves so it can be sustainable. So, in effect, I was pretty much doing the job of the netball bodies um, and without their support. And, um, 
you know, and I was able to do that through um, a not-for-profit organisation that I was working for. So, and, and we were very fortunate to get corporate funding and support, you know, so we were doing that without any governing body funding. So for this, to, for this announcement to happen today, um, there's been a lot of behind the scenes work going with Marcy and I and um, a few others heavily involved in the discussions um, and getting to get this statement out. And Marcy and I stand with Netball Australia. We want to, you know, we, we, we understand that it's not us, up to us to fix the problem. It's up to Netball to fix the problem, but we stand beside them in helping them to achieve that. And just as a curious question, but when you run tournaments and other events, do you get support from local government or what we call local councils in New Zealand, like might term them shires and parts of Australia? Do they help out or assist with like the likes of venues and other logistics side of things? Um, we haven't really had to use other venues because because Cairns Netball, and so they'll run a similar program in Towns with Townsville Netball Association as well. They have their own venues. So we've been fortunate in that regard. Um, I think before Cairns Netball got their um, covered courts, we did have to use um, PCYCs quite a bit to go indoors because it's so hot up there, you know, a lot of the time of the year. Um, I don't recall ever getting any kind of support or contra or you know sponsorship for venues or anything like that. Um, we get uh, in Cairns, for instance, there's a, a wonderful organisation there called Mitrangani Cultural Training Centre. They get funding through um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And every year since day one, since that carnival has been running, we get um, you know a small amount of money from them, but that helps us to be able to run the event. Um, and the good, the good and yeah so i mean that it's not good enough like we're not getting enough support that we need to be able to run those carnivals and, and development camps effectively um and you know and we want to be able to tap into funding that helps support the girls to get there you know the girls that come from the torres strait and the top of australia like it's it, it's an enormous cost for them and that's a big inhibitor for them because um, when I selected, I think there was three girls that I selected from the Torres Strait um, from Thursday Island into that development um, squad and only one of them could afford to come back because they just didn't have the funds to get down there. So, you know, for those girls living in those um, isolated areas, it's a big barrier for them to even, even dream about becoming a diamond. So I think netball needs to have a look at how, how they can best support um, you know, our girls that are living in those areas as well. And maybe they need to look at, you know, I saw some write up in the Cairns Post about, um, you know, um, Cairns becoming the hub for, far north, you know, becoming the hub for develop, you know, netball, Indigenous netball development. And that, that's what I would love to see. We need some hubs set up around the country where those remote and regional um, communities can access opportunities, carnivals, camps, you know, like just participation opportunities. Um, because otherwise they're having to travel, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometres just to get to, to access these. That was one thing I was actually having a discussion with someone on Twitter about during the um, Indigenous round. Uh, they were talking about that not just Indigenous, but also, um, you know, other athletes in general from regional and country areas, mm. um, Sharon. They reckon that the MOs aren't doing enough in terms of having talent spotters and because the, associ the, the state associations are too, should we say, city-centric. Is that? Mm. Do you get that feeling? Because it sounds like in Queensland they do have good support, but in other MOs or states, I believe that's not the case. Yeah, Queensland do a pretty decent job in that area. I, I, I believe they do. Um, you know, like they have... Well, when just talking from an Indigenous perspective, they've got their Diamond Spirit program and that targets girls up in that sort of far north, right up, you know, Arakoon and Marpoon and um, those kind of areas up there and, Yarra, you know, Yarrabah. Um, but, you know, we've also got, you know, we've also got teams in the Sapphire and Ruby Series um, competition, um, you know, our Northern Rays team and our Magnetic North Steel Cats. Um, and I think the only, the only other region where they have um, a team is in the Darling Downs, which is the Panthers, which is that southwest regional area of Brisbane. Um, and it looks after a real, it, it covers a large geographical area for there. But between sort of north of um, Sunshine Coast and south of Mackay, there's a little bit of a gap there really for girls um, to be able to access 
um, pathways because there's really not a lot happening. As far as I'm aware, there's not a lot happening for those girls. So, um, but, you know, the Northern Rays team, that's made up of girls from Cairns, Townsville and Mackay. So, you know, that's still a long way to travel for one team to come together and train. And they don't often get that time they need to be able to develop combinations before a carnival or a competition comes up. So it's, um, you know, even more challenging for those, for, for girls within, within the region. Um, you know, and it's, it's mostly just the cost of it all, really. And I think that, you know, Netball Queensland, that's probably just the main area that they really need to look at is the cost, trying to reduce the cost for those girls. Because that, you know, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, that's a barrier for a lot of families, the cost involved of travel um, and getting, getting players to these events. And if they want to have the best players, they need to not just take the ones that can afford it, you know, they need to have the right players there. But, you know, in saying that too, um, Netball Queensland do have selectors based in um, Townsville and Cairns and Mackay. You know, like they do have representatives there as selectors. I have been in that role before. So um, that way at least those ladies are getting a good look at the talent and they can put those names forward to Netball Queensland to say, hey, you know, we've seen this girl play at a, a various um, carnival. We like to put their name forward. So, you know, they are, they are doing some good things in that space. And just looking longer term, because the immediate impact of COVID, at least the economic impact, has been devastating worldwide. But in the future, if a business or someone wants to sponsor one of the tournaments you run or the, the efforts you're putting into growing that ball with the Australian Indigenous community, how to get hold of you or what do they do? Well, funny you should say that because I, um, you know, prior to the Gemma Mai Mai incident, my profile in the community was actually not as high as what it once was, you know, um, even though I've been running programs in, at community level, um, you know, a lot of that hasn't really been promoted. And um, I think the, the incident with Gemma and my, I guess, commentating the Indigenous round has sort of raised my profile um, a little bit more than it has been in recent years. So, um, I've, you know, I've been on Twitter quite a bit, um, promoting not so much the work I do, but promoting the work that others are doing in the community. And, um, you know, this has given me a real voice to be able to promote what's going on out there and, and listen to the stories from some of the people who are the ones that are driving hundreds of kilometres to get girls to carnivals and have started up their own Indigenous teams and, and have talked to me about the, the real challenges and barriers that some of these girls are facing you know like you know it's it's really quite complex and um you know if if people knew the you know some of the heartbreaking stories of some of our young girls um then you know you would see how important netball is for them to be able to get away from some of the things that they're facing in life and netball just takes them away from all that stuff and yeah, and, 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 and just getting back to your point, Luke, um, I have had a, 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 a lady donate $5,000 to the Sharon Finn and Cup and the Far North Queensland Pro, um, Indigenous Program. So, you know, thank you to that person. She doesn't want to be acknowledged. She is just happy to put the money and the funds into um, a good cause. Um, and, yeah, if anybody else would like to do the same, um, they can just contact me through Twitter, just send me a message and I can, um, you know, make contact with them and we can discuss, um, yeah, their support. But certainly um, I hope that after today that Netball Australia and um, Netball Queensland in particular for what I'm doing here in this state will, um, I guess, take a little bit more notice of, of the work that I am doing with, with Cairns and Townsville Netball. And I hope that a lot of other associations around the state will look at the model that I've set up and that we've set up and developed that it could be a model for them to take on as well because, you know, um, I think the hardest thing is really for um, associations is probably knowing how to engage with our community. You know, running the, running the events is easy because that's what they do. That's what they know how to do. They can run the events, but it's about engaging with the community and developing those relationships and having that trust um, with each other, I think, more than anything. And just to wrap up too, Sharon, I believe you coached your Netball World Cup. I remember um, seeing you a number of years ago. Was that, that was with the Caribbean team, is that right? 
Yeah, I uh, went over to Trinidad and Tobago for six mm. months as the, their technical director. Um, mm. And I, I guess I kind of fell into a, almost assistant coach role while I was over there. But it was more to sort of help support the netball associations over there in um, developing their coaches and setting a bit of a development strategy for them. Um, but, yeah, I sort of also was helping to sort of um, coach the girls and went away with them to the 2007 World Cup in New Zealand, I think it was at Auckland. And, um, yeah, it was a really wonderful experience. It was very challenging for me because I had, you know, I left my two-year-old son at home with his dad and grandparents to take up this opportunity and um, which I thought was going to be great for my coaching um, portfolio. Um, it was, I really fell out of my comfort zone over there. It's a completely different culture to what I'm used to. Um, but I did ask them, I said, look, you know, cause I was up against some pretty high profile coaches and I said, well, you know, what, what, why did you pick me for that, for this position? And they said, well, we've been looking at the work that you do with indigenous communities in Australia and we feel that you were the best fit for what we wanted over here. And so, you know, I thought that was really um, a nice thing. So, yeah, so that was a really nice experience um, for me. And, you know, if, if that opportunity came again, I'd probably look at it. All right, Sharon, thanks very much for joining us today. Looking forward to what's going to hopefully be a very monumentous occasion, not just for Indigenous um, sport, but Indigenous rights and politics later on today. Um, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Luke.